Good afternoon, everybody. This is part two of the technical training in uh, bird sound recording using a phone and an adapted parabola. I am speaking from the UK. I'm one of three of us in the Planet Bird Song Foundation, a small group who have set up to bring bird sound recording, data collection and citizen science uh, to Rwanda. And we're working in close collaboration with the University of Rwanda Centre of Excellence in Biodiversity. The other trustees are Peter Cowdery, a recordist, composer and musician, and Isaac Herman, who is a bioacoustician, educational technologist and a game designer. <coughs> Excuse me. My background is in urban planning. Uh, I'm a chartered town planner and I spent over 30 years in development management with a strong interest in environmental protection, uh, bringing environmental protection into our mainstream work and particularly focusing on uh, sustainable development. I'm now retired and concentrate on bird conservation and habitat protection and training of people involved in bird watching and now bird sound recording. So today we're doing part two. We're going to cover field craft, scientific metadata and labeling and record notes. This will be uh, lodged as a YouTube on the Centre of Excellence Miranda uh, YouTube channel. And uh, the slides that you're seeing today will be shared. In fact, they've already been shared with anybody who is registered with us uh, on the Google group, Planet Birdsong Training Participants. So fieldcraft, now I'm well aware that many of you are experts in fieldcraft uh, because of your work. Now, I'm just going to focus on a few particular aspects of this relating to recording sound. First of all, like in part one, I'm going to refer you to an extremely useful link in the eBird resources relating to sound recording. This one is sound recording tips, and this will give you a great deal of information, and I would recommend it very strongly to you in order to expand your knowledge of this subject and to inform your practice. So a few key tips. First of all, uh, try to be as quiet as possible and included in this is try to dress in soft, quiet clothing that doesn't rustle too much when you move. And um, it doesn't have to be a dark colour, but obviously that helps to uh, give you cover when you're trying to get closer to the birds. Secondly, have your phone recording app open and ready. In part one, we talked about the RecForge 2 recording app, and I recommend it to you. Have a look in part one uh, about how to set that up. At this point, you want to have it open and ready. Uh, birds don't give a very long to make a recording. And make sure the location, the phone location, is on. And when you start recording, use your ears very carefully to point the functional microphone directly at the bird. You'll recall from part one, the functional microphone can be tested by just tapping your finger on the small holes at the top and bottom of the phone and on the side to make sure that the one that you are pointing at the target bird is the one that's actually accepting the recording. So stand still. As soon as you hear a subject you're interested in, stand still and lock your feet in a comfortable position and start by making an initial recording. This might not be your ideal position relative to the bird, uh, but don't hesitate to just make an initial recording in case the subject goes away, flies off, or, or indeed stops singing. Uh, once you've made that initial recording, that's your insurance recording, if you like, you can then approach slowly and aim to make a better recording make sure you're facing away from 
interrupting noises such as traffic, a, a fast moving river, wind, uh, uh, people uh, making sound in the background if you can, uh, although distant sound from people is part of the important metadata that gives context to the bird recording. Use cover uh, to disguise your presence and move to the side if the bird is singing in that direction. So if you can see the bird uh, and you can see which direction it's singing, try to move towards that direction. In terms of uh, angle at which you point your phone, a 45 degree angle up to the bird is better than standing directly underneath it. This is to do with the way the sound waves are projected out from the bird. Hold, although you might be in cover yourself, try and hold the microphone away from the cover uh, vegetation if you can. Uh, this is because very close by leaves, can, their rustle really shows up in the recording. So you set yourself up as best you can and you make another recording. Uh, this is your second recording. And what we're aiming at is around about 40 to 60 second clips. And that later allows you to extract the best 30 second clips uh, for the final submission and to take out any extraneous noise at the beginning and the end, that kind of thing. So I've adopted an acronym, SOIL, S-O-I-L, to help me remember the order of procedure. And this means sound record, observe, identify, and label. It is essential to follow this order. It's very easy as bird watchers to try and look for the bird and identify it before you start recording. Try not to do this because the aim here is to get a sound recording. So make that your first priority. And it's necessary to do this because very often the bird will stop singing or calling or indeed fly away and you've lost your opportunity. So first priority is to make a sound recording. You can then move on to observing as you get into your more ideal position and you can make a, a second recording and you can start observing the bird if you can possibly see it to try and identify it. And all the time you're listening uh, to other sounds around you uh, as context for this bird recording and potentially a further uh, recording later. So you're focusing on bird sound, not on bird watching. Try to record and label a few birds well, not many badly. This isn't bird listing like you might be doing on a, day, a day's bird watching. Uh, you're trying to get good recordings. And if you go, go back from a morning's work, with perhaps five good recordings, then you're doing very well. So that, that is the objective. If you have an opportunity, take a photo if you can and describe uh, the setting and the bird in recorded notes. We'll come back to recording notes a little bit later in the talk. I suggest teams of two people is ideal. Um, this may allow one to record and the other to observe and identify and take a photograph of the bird and remember to take a photograph of the habitat as well. All this helps to identify the bird if its identification is not known or you're not sure and also helps the scientists later when they're examining this record and this bird, uh, the habitat and the vegetation information is extremely useful. So working in pairs is also good security, but you can practice working alone. It is the quietest way and you can make very good re recordings on your own. And certainly as you're practicing and building up your skills, then working alone is perfectly good. You can go out in a bigger group. That's not fine as well. But I do suggest that you break up into pairs um, uh, and this simply reduces the noise in the immediate surroundings. So I want to talk about what you are looking for. 
as well as uh, making the recording of your target species. This is when we talk about metadata. Now, metadata is data that describes and gives information about the target bird. And all the uh, information given in these columns can be described as metadata. It helps to describe your record. And the field labeling of your record with the species and the metadata, as well as the method of recording, are very important because if these things are not gathered and recorded at the time you make your recording, then your recording is far less useful to science and education. So this is a really important part of the procedure. You have to give time to it uh, after you've made a recording, uh, but it's well worth doing and it is essential if you want to submit good records. So there are two stages. There's a quick labeling in the field whilst uh, immediately after you've made the recording. And then there's final labeling and cataloging later. So what uh, exactly are we collecting here? Uh, as well as the, um, the bird identity, if you can do that. Uh, we, we're looking for the date and the time. Uh, we're looking for the location, which would be a GPS plot, and the name of the place. And we're looking for the elevation, habitat type name, and within that habitat, what species is the bird actually utilising? What's the host species? What is it sitting on? We're looking for the weather, um, obviously the species name and the number present or recorded. So you might be recording one example of the species singing, but there may be a small flock present. So you try to estimate the number immediately around. You want to record the distance to the species because this helps to um, in the identification of the sound and improves the uh, the distance, obviously, the closer you can get, the, this improves the quality of your recording. Try not to get too close because you'll frighten the bird away. But uh, distance to the species does help utilize the data later. You might want, it, you should record any other species uh, present uh, in the vicinity and record it on your sound recording. So that would be other species being other birds or indeed uh, incidental animals. And these can be domestic or wild animals. And record the recording method. Now I've read down column, um, the column on the left, which is the requirements of an eBird data entry, scientific data entry. And if you collect all that information, you have pretty much covered other places other platforms where this data might be shared later. And that could be iNaturalist, or indeed we aim to put this data onto the Rwanda biodiversity, uh, that should say biological actually, information system, RBIS. And uh, that particular set of data covers everything you need in your record. So, Labeling, the vital thing, labeling. The field labeling is the first thing. So how do we go about that? I've described a lot of information to you. So let's make it simple in the field and then you follow through with other information um, subsequently after you've made the recording. So record the information as follows. You'll find this in uh, the phone recording apps and, and in particular RecForge 2, the one I recommend, the uh, file automatically records the date and the time. So you don't need to put that in, it will be automatically there. That's very useful because it's unique, particularly the time point, as this acts as a useful temporary unique identifier in, uh, in the file list. You might recall from part one, you saw the home page of the RecForge 2 app open, and there was a list of files. And in there, the first thing you see is the date and the time for each file. And that helps you to identify each one uh, individually. And then you add 
um, the place name. Now I suggest a local name, something people can recognize, uh, something which uh, identifies a small area, uh, something which is familiar to other people and uh, not a generic name such as three trees down from the big stone. It needs to be an, a, a, a name which is used locally. Uh, in there goes the species name. And at this stage, when you're trying to be quick in the field, you can use initials. And these are very easily constructed. For example, PTW would be pintailed wider. And generally you would take the first letter of a multi-worded name or possibly the first two letters of a single worded name. If you're unsure of the identification of the bird uh, because you haven't seen it or indeed you can't identify it or you're not certain, add a question mark to that name. And then you're putting in the number present, whether it's a song or a call, uh, approximate distance to the subject in metres, three metres, 10 metres, 20 metres, that sort of thing. And then additional, additional species recorded. Again, you can use um, initials as a shorthand at this stage when you're out in the field making a quick label for your list of files on your phone. So a field file name on your phone would look like um, uh, like this. So I'm just going to use the cursor. So here we have the date and the time point that comes up automatically. Uh, the place name, Brockhurst is a farm, so it's local. Uh, CH is the, are the initials of a chaffinch down here. If you follow through on the blue line, you can see what all these abbreviations mean. So we're up to CH, chaffinch question mark. I know it's a chaffinch, but the question mark is there to remind me you can use a question mark uh, so that the identification of this bird can be carefully checked later. Uh, there are two present, so times two. It is singing, so S. If it's a call, you would use C. Uh, the recording is 25 metres from the subject and also in this recording in the vicinity, we have a wren, W-R, wren, uh, a blackbird, which is a bee, and we have an incidental animal, uh, a domestic animal, uh, a sheep. So that's S-H-P. Uh, and so in the blue underneath, you can translate that coding and see what it all means. By making these labels, this is the easiest way later to identify individual clips from your phone list and it's much quicker and more precise than speaking this list into the phone and making recorded notes for the basic file name so use that uh, capacity in recforge 2 to um, label your recordings as you go along this, this simple uh, label is sufficient for common birds unless it's part of a research project and then we'll go on to more information uh, and also for practicing. Uh, but then we do need to expand this label a little bit further. One thing that is really useful to science and to help people find the position of this bird later is to plot its position, uh, which is a uh, global positioning plot and this uh, can be done on your phone if you do have access to a, a, a gps plotter that's fine use it but we're trying to make this system accessible to citizen scientists who can use uh, the equipment they already have available to them so we can do a gps plot on the phone this is why you need to have the location open uh, when you start recording and what you do is go into Google Maps. You may be familiar with them, but you can find them uh, within uh, the phone Google um, apps. And you go to the terrain map. Now this is uh, to be found in this uh, little icon here, little diamond, and you click on that and click on terrain. 
and that uh, sets up the terrain map which shows the contours giving the height of the terrain uh, running around the hills and also uh, you can just about see the shading which represents the hills. This example is, is in England near where I live and it is a hilly area. I deliberately did that so that you could see what was happening. And what you're going to do is um, when this opens, you will see your own position uh, in as a blue dot, if you're familiar with that. Um, but you can practice this anywhere. And that gives your absolutely that gives your present position where you're making the recording. You need to do this where you are making the recording. Um, after you've made the recording before you move on to another place so that your GPS plotting is accurate. You drop a red pin onto that uh, blue dot, as I've done at, my, uh, at position one here. That's where I was standing. And then um, this gives you at the top, in the box at the top, the GPS position. So what you do now is simply copy that uh, set of numbers and paste them into the label in your RecForge2 app. So you're, you're toggling between Google Maps and then back into RecForge. Your file label is there waiting and you simply paste this number into the label box. At the same time, you need the elevation. Again, this is very useful because you'll be aware that um, the elevation is very relevant to the uh, range of birds and their locations and indeed the numbers that uh, might be present. So you can do elevation in the same way. You use this terrain map, you find the nearest contour in dark grey. You can see this one here following through and that's mark two on this map. That is the 100 metres above sea level contour. And from that you can uh, go towards your blue dot and you're counting up the number of contour lines. So each contour line represents a further 20 metres up this hill. These are rather faint, so some of you may not be able to see them, but there is a further contour there, so that's 120 metres up the hill. And then we have another one here, so we're up to 140 metres up the hill above sea level. And then we have about half the distance again between those two. So I think we can safely call this 150 metres elevation above sea level. It's not absolutely precise, but it's extremely close and it's sufficient to give the general elevational position of your target bird. So two things to do while your map's open and those two pieces of information can then be put into your label immediately after you've made your recording. So we talked about uh, recording notes earlier. Recording notes, whilst they're not your primary source of information, that should be in the label so it's easy to see. But eBird, Macaulay Library eBird, do seek as part of the metadata a sound clip with voice recording of notes. And this appears at the end of the recording after you've left a one second gap. So you stop your recording and then you start it again and then you start to speak. And these are real time notes recorded at the time. And they're very useful for researchers and they add contextual information. And some of those additional information features that I listed earlier on. So you, you, you can mention the uh, species again, the, the name of the species. Uh, you can add in uh, gen uh, the gender if known, um, place name if you want to mention it again, you've actually put it into your file name anyway. Talk about the habitat. This is very sure, very important if you're unsure of the identification because habitat can help the verifier of this data to work out what this bird is. So what is the bird doing? Is it perched? Is it foraging for food? Is it threatened? 
Is it doing some courtship of some kind? So just mention in your recording notes what the bird is actually doing when you make that recording, uh, if you can actually see it. Uh, look for breeding evidence. If it's singing, it's likely to be in a territory, a breeding territory. Um, is there any evidence of courtship? That's another indication that breeding might be starting. If you spot a nest that belongs to this bird, don't disturb it, please. But um, it is an indication of breeding. Uh, you might find eggshell scraps. Uh, if you can uh, associate them with this bird, breeding evidence again. And particularly if you see juven young juveniles with the, the flock of birds or with these adult birds. So you can say all this on your recorded notes. This is the place to record the weather, temperature you can get from your phone, uh, cloud cover in a, a percentage, 100% cloud cover means it's darker and your visibility is less good and that does not help your identification. Doesn't affect the recording particularly, but it's useful to the uh, verifier to know how much visibility you had at the time you made the recording. Uh, is it raining? and the wind direction, uh, these are useful factors uh, in scientific use of um, your data. So you can actually comment on visibility. Sometimes you can, well, most of the time you can simply say visibility is clear. Again, it helps the verifier uh, when you propose a name for this bird, what you believe it is. Uh, if he knows that you had very good visibility, that obviously reinforces what you've said. But if you say it was very misty then, and you didn't have clear visibility, then that's some indication that you perhaps didn't get as good a view of this bird to help with the identification. So method of recording. So you can say uh, if you use the parabolic uh, uh, microphone dish, you can say so. Just put in para. RecForge 2, which is the uh, recommended uh, voice recorder. It's a WAV file, WAV file at 48 hertz mono. Now these are settings which will uh, have followed if you did part one and if you haven't managed to see part one yet I would refer you back to that to understand how you're using the phone. At this point you can mention any background disturbance so perhaps a vehicle went past, a helicopter flew over, loud voices, drumming, electronic music coming from somewhere. This is <clears throat> useful to know when somebody else is listening to your recording later. Although in part three, I will show you how to minimize these background noises as much as possible so they don't interfere with your recording. Uh, you can mention your name, the recordist, and if a photograph is taken, mention the name of the photographer, or assistant perhaps, and uh, we need their name. And eventually you can put in there the verifier, the person who confirms the identification of your record, because obviously we need to know when uh, records go to credible scientific data sets that the identification is accurate. So, your full label can look like this. Uh, so you've done an initial field label. Uh, you have the date and the time here. After you've made your initial field label, you can cut and paste into it the GPS position, which is this number here. You do all this before you leave your location. Uh, the elevation is 100, uh, so perhaps 1,000 metres above sea level. In my example, it was only 150 meters above sea level uh, this is more this is a this is perhaps a more typical measurement uh, the place name then appears and here we spell out the name of the bird initially uh, you put in the um, initials um, now to complete the full label i'm spelling out the name in full perhaps it's still a question mark perhaps you're not certain of the identification you think there were two there um, it was a song and 25 metres away, 
and then you spell out the other species in the vicinity, wren, blackbird, and indeed the sheep. And at the end, it automatically gives WAV files as opposed to MP3 or MP4. We need WAV files because they are complete sound records rather than compressed sound records. So remember, you also have a voice recording at the end of your record with the additional information. Uh, this stays on the file as part of the recording, but for purposes of clarity and to help the verifiers and the researchers, uh, it is recommended that you make a transcript of the, the voice recording and write down what it says. Uh, the reason for this is when you enter sound data, any data into eBird, there is a box for comments and it's here you can put the transcript of the sound recording. So here's an example format uh, with all the things I've already mentioned, species name, and here you can add in the scientific name once you have a confirmed and verified identification, um, gender, place name, etc. And notice here I'm describing the habitat, uh, habitat oak wood, that's a particular kind of forest, and the bird was foraging in oak, which is a tree and uh, juveniles were present. So a lot of useful information in there. There's the recordist, that's me. Um, I didn't have an assistant on this occasion. And the verifier comes at the end, Joe Bird, who is a very helpful person. Doesn't exist in my case, but uh, that just is for illustration. So that completes today's uh, instructions and technical um, introduction to uh, part two. Uh, so I invite you to go out and practice these skills. I think once you get going, you will enjoy this skill. You can build up your skills and your competencies. Uh, very important to read the links which are provided in these slides and very important to open your ears to your surroundings and make sound your priority um, whenever you're out. And listen out for the unusual. We said this in the last slide, but really listen out for the unusual and be ready to make a recording if you possibly can. And because that could be a really important find. It, it, some people are really lucky and get a really uh, scarce bird in their first few trips out. It might be you, uh, let's hope so. But it doesn't matter if you're only making common birds, the more recordings you make, the better. So keep those recordings for now. And in part three, I will show you how to process those recordings for best effect to um, in, before you issue them to the verifier and then put them into the data set. So what we're going to do now is uh, put this recording into the Center of Excellence in Biodiversity YouTube uh, channel. And you can see all these slides in the Planning Birdsong Training Participants Google Group. I will issue the link. And uh, to, to read those, you will need Google Drive app on your phone or your laptop. Uh, but with that, you will already have access to all the slides from the introduction, part one, part two, and later parts three and four. So Mukhazi Chane, and I look forward to seeing how many manage to get out there and make some good recordings, keep those, and you can use those for processing and learning those skills later on. So, okay, goodbye for now, and I will see you again.